All right, I think I got... Uh, I think I got this going. We'll see how long it lasts. Matthew 17 uh, is where we're going to go. But uh, I want to begin with a question this morning. The question is this, and you don't have to answer, but I want you to think about it seriously. Have you ever had an experience in life where you, you just, you knew, you found yourself looking around thinking something about this experience is different? Something about this moment is different. Something about uh, the, the season I'm in or this particular location that I might be in is, uh, is different. And I say different, but what I mean is, is that it is deeply spiritual. You find yourself looking around. You know, maybe it's hard to describe, but, but it's, a, it's a moment or it's a place that feels like heaven just might be a little bit closer to earth. Like you're not entirely sure what's going on, uh, but the veil, the, the distance between heaven and between earth seems short or it feels thin, like it's just, it's close. God is present in this moment, whatever it is. Like I said, like the space between what you perceive, what you say as heaven, what is spiritual and what is here with what you are experiencing around you, tasting and seeing and smelling feels like it is one. Some people call these places in life thin places, thin places, because it just feels like it's right there. Let me give you an example, a couple examples. Uh, I went on a winter camping trip, a winter hiking trip up into Algonquin Park, and I think I've maybe talked about it a little bit before, Um, but we hiked in in the middle of the night, Uh, not quite the middle of the night, but it was dark. It was dark like it was the middle of the night, okay? And the hike took way longer than we thought it should have taken, uh, six hours, seven hours, eight hours, like we were hours beyond what it should have been. Uh, middle of the night when we arrived, pitch black, and uh, we got, we found our campsite and sat down, and it was like minus 30, minus 35. We sat down, and I can remember the silence and it was a busy season in life, and it was actually, it was uh, in the midst of the pandemic, and just this wildly what felt like a uh, crazy-making season of life, busy, a lot happening, a lot going on, it's just to sit in the silence in that moment. To me, felt like one of those thin places like where the, the veil was thin between heaven and earth. And into that moment, there were these pings that started firing across into, like, into the silence, which is a little bit eerie, but it was the ice cracking. It was so cold. The ice pushing the pressure that the ice was generating was causing these massive cracks to shoot out. And that's all we heard. It sounded like thunder in the middle of the silence. And that, to me, in the middle of Algonquin Park was one of those places where it just felt like God for us who were there was present. Years ago, I found myself also in Algonquin Park, which is like a theme for me. Maybe for you, either that resonates with you or you're like, no, you've lost me at the beginning. The middle of a canoe trip, again, after an exceptionally long day, we got lost a couple times, ended up on a portage that took six hours instead of, you know, half an hour and portage. It was kilometers long. Again, in the middle, just in that night, sitting in the quiet, reflecting and thinking and praying. I mean, in that moment, the northern lights came out for us who were there. And so I don't know if you've ever seen the northern lights, but they're all inspiring. So again, it felt like one of those, felt like one of those moments. And so you say, okay, well, great. Those are two like exceptional moments, right? Where it's kind of hard not to feel like there's something deeply spiritual going on. Uh, but I'll give you one last example and then moving on. For, for me, again, into an incredibly difficult season, I received a text message from a friend. And I'm sitting in my family room, and the sun's shining in, and there's kids' toys everywhere, and there's dirty dishes in the sink, and like life is absolutely messy. Like I'm in the middle of mess with kids, uh, with uh, all of it. Like I'm pretty sure there is like, uh, anyways, diapers all over the place. Friends sent to me one text message, and all it was is, here's a song, I think you need to hear it. And I played that song, and I sat there, and I just cried. And again, like just so that, not an exceptional moment, not a particular, you know, neat, tidy, clean moment. But again, one of those moments where you know there's something here. God is is present. And I hope that you've had one of those moments. I hope that you've had a chance to have a deeply spiritual moment. Matthew 17 is one of those moments. It might actually be like the original of those moments, like the ultimate moment 
where the distance between heaven and earth is close, where heaven descends into, breaks into earth. And, and it's a pivotal moment in the Gospel of Matthew. And it's not so much a pivotal moment for Jesus, so it, it, it is, we're working toward that. It's a pivotal moment for the disciples who are invited along into this mountaintop experience that they have with Jesus. They're invited, three of them are invited to witness this moment. And so what I wanna do is just simply locate it because I think my iPad's gi given up here. Um, but uh, I'll read. I want to locate this and then read it for you. But we're working essentially right now one week after. It works out perfectly. One week after the events of last week. And so this is why I love Bruce preached last week on the exchange between Jesus and his disciples at Caesarea Philippi. And so Caesarea Philippi, where people long before Jesus would have gathered and worshipped different gods. There were idols to different statues, different statues commemorating different deities. Uh, people would gather and worship and uh, in full view of all of these things, in full view of all of these idols and statues and different gods and different options for people to worship, Jesus turns to his disciples and he says, who do you say that I am? Peter declares, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And it's this great moment. Jesus then goes on to predict his death. And he says, listen, you are right. And hey, guess what? The son of man, uh, me, I need to go and die in order to fulfill what I have been sent here to do. And, and Peter then has this moment where he rebukes Jesus. He kind of turns and says, no, this will never happen to you. These things are never going to happen. You can't die. Like, surely there's a different way. Surely you're wrong about this, Jesus. Like, there's got to be some other thing that we can do to get this message out, the message of your kingdom. There's got to be a, a, another way. And, and then there's that line that, that Bruce talked us through where Jesus turns and rebukes Peter. And he says, get behind me, Satan. Right? He says, listen, like, Peter, like, you don't actually know what you're talking about. You don't know what needs to happen. Peter has this up and down moment of declaring Jesus to be the Messiah son of the living God, and then immediately, we were one week later, Jesus takes Peter, along with James and John, away up a mountain to show them who he really is. Peter's declared it, and he's wrestled with it. He's having a little bit of a hard time processing it, and so Jesus takes them away to show them who he is. And so in verse uh, 1, starting... And I'll read it for us here. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. Six days, right? Peter, James, and John, they're taken up a mountain with Jesus. And so we know something is going to happen. I've read a little bit further on. We know that something is going to happen. Because for so much of Jesus' ministry, Jesus takes his disciples off in a particular direction and the crowds, they follow him. And sometimes there's many and sometimes there are few, but Jesus, he's, he's teaching his disciples. And as he teaches his disciples, he's also teaching the crowds. This time though, it seems like Jesus is extra deliberate in getting away, like really away with only a few disciples. Not even all the disciples are invited into this moment, right? Only three of them, Peter, James, and John. They're the ones that Jesus takes with him up the mountain. Interesting, we're gonna see in a few weeks that these are the same three that Jesus takes into the garden of Gethsemane to pray. They keep falling asleep, comes back, say, hey, stay here, stay awake while I, while I go and, and pray. Same three. Not even all the disciples are, are invited up into this moment. And, and it's significant, and there's like a, a hint that it's gonna be significant. Because I don't know if you've noticed this in reading the Bible or not, but I don't think there's ever a moment or ever an insignificant thing that happens when the, the main players go up a high mountain in, in the Bible. Whenever somebody goes up a high mountain, you're like, okay, some, I gotta pay attention to this. Something's gonna happen. There's a reason why spiritually rich and impactful moments in life are called mountaintop experiences. So what we see in scripture over and over again is that God pulls people up this up a mountain, different mountains, but up a mountain in order to meet with them. And so Moses in the book of Exodus, is taken up Mount Sinai to meet with God and receive the Ten Commandments. He goes up, he receives the law, he writes, he comes back down, and what happens? When he returns, his face and his clothes are shining with light. They're bright. Goes up a mountain, he meets with God, and he returns. 
Elijah, a prophet, was taken up a mountain, this time Mount Carmel, to defeat prophets of Baal. And so what's going on in that story is, listen, like there are prophets, they're worshiping Baal, and Elijah worshiping God, and he kind of challenges them to a duel. He says, hey, listen, like, let's both of us, we'll go up, we'll go up the mountain, we will build altars, and whichever God lights the altar with fire, that's the one true God. So Elijah, he goes up, and God causes fire to rain down from heaven, lighting the altar, proving himself to be the one true God. The mountaintop experiences mountaintop experiences. Like, I can't imagine being up, meeting with God, being given the law and the Ten Commandments, right? He's got to do it twice. Moses got to go back up. Uh, but then Elijah, again, fire from heaven raining down. These are mountaintop high spiritual experiences. What we see are these three disciples. They're taken up the mountain with Jesus, and there he is transfigured in verse 2. As we read, he is transfigured before them. His face shines like the sun. His clothes become as white as the light. And just then, there appeared before them these two guys, Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus, the other two who had significant mountaintop experiences. So what are we told? We're told that Jesus is transfigured. He's transfigured. And, and the word here um, is important. I think it's going to uh, sound similar to what you know. The word transfigured, or that we arrive at transfigured by, is metamorpho. You don't need to remember that. All you need to know is it sounds kind of like metamorphosis. This is, this is the word used to describe what happens to Jesus. And it, it's a word that means to be transformed to change form, but in a very crucial way, to change form in keeping with an inner reality, with what is really true, right? And it's the same word that Paul uses when he writes his letter to the church and he says, hey, listen, you need to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What he's saying is, is allow God to transform your heart, allow God to transform your mind in a way that, that it was intended to be in the way that it's been created to be, in what is true, in how God has made you. Jesus doesn't shape shift, right? Like it's not like a, right? It's a full on change in appearance. He reveals who he truly is to the disciples. They get a glimpse at his full nature, fully God, all of his goodness, all of his wonder, a little bit, probably more than a little bit, of fear-inducing awe we're going to see is shown to the disciples. We talk about Jesus as being fully human and fully God. And in this moment, the glory of God is on full display. Right? Heaven and earth are not just close, but heaven is actually breaking into earth. And the disciples, they get to witness it. They get to see it with their own eyes. Jesus is who he says he is. He is God. God's glory is fully present. Stanley Hauerwas, who writes a commentary on the book of Matthew, as I'm sure you've guessed by now, uh, says this, Jesus is transfigured, and we begin to see the glory of the God whose home is among mortals, who will dwell with us and make us his people, wiping away every tear, and death will be no more. What he's saying is that this moment points toward the final hope found in Revelation. And if you want to find it, it's Revelation 21. God coming to dwell on earth, restoring things to the, the way they were meant to be, begins, finds its ultimate home in Jesus. And so as Jesus' glory is revealed, he's pointing toward the day where forever God will come to dwell with humanity. And he's pulling, he's saying, listen, Moses all of the law, Elijah, all of the prophets pointing toward Jesus and Jesus himself pointing toward this final ultimate hope where death will be no more. God coming to dwell on earth. I love the picture of this mountain that, that Jesus invites and there's debate as to which mountain it is and it's a couple different options and but I love the image of Jesus pulling these three guys up a mountain with him. And thinking about it as like the last mountain people would have to climb in order to see God, in order to be with God. 
or through the Old Testament, these guys had to walk up to where God was present. They had to go to be with God over and over again. And, and what we see in this moment is that God finally comes down to be with humanity. For both Moses and Elijah, their mountaintop experiences were significant because God came to meet with them. But Moses' face, it only shines because it was reflecting the glory of God. It's like a byproduct of being near God, right? Moses' face shines because of God's glory. But Jesus' face shines, we're told, because of who he is. He's not reflecting the light of God. He is the light of God. There's a difference between um, the moon reflecting the light from the sun and the sun generating its own light. And I'm not a scientist, but I'm pretty sure that that's how it works, right? The sun shines, the moon reflects, it's a mirror. Like, that's, this is what happens. Jesus is the light of God. He is the glory of God. Come to dwell with humanity. And this moment is Jesus revealing who he truly is and who he is for the world. And the disciples are invited to witness it, to see it, right? To see who he really is. And I think we're given a glimpse of who he really is through the story. Then a really interesting thing happens. Peter confronted with Jesus, whose face is shining, and with Moses and Elijah, who really, like by sheer uh, number of years that have passed, shouldn't be around, right? Like these guys, long gone, says the most Peter thing that came to his mind. Peter, who is known for what? Thinking first and acting later, or uh, acting first and thinking, right, second. Like this is, this is how he's known. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good that for us to be here, if you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Lord, it's good that we were here. It's a good thing. And I mean, it is. It was. But I love how this line comes across. On the one hand, like, it's not bad. Uh, it even seems a little bit considerate. Like, you might read it and be like, hey, okay, like, this is, this is Peter trying to take care of everybody, right? We've got Moses, we've got Elijah, we've got Jesus. They've come uh, they're talking, three people who ascended mountains, who met with God, like at least two of them came back and their faces were shining, like there's something similar going on here maybe, and let's try to make sense of it. What he's doing is saying, let's try to make sense of it. How can I make sense of what is happening in front of me? How, how can I understand it? And Peter sees what's happening. He knows that like, something is, is going on. And, and he says, listen, it's good that, that we were here. I'll build three shelters, one, one for each of you. And that's not an innocuous line. What he's doing, what it, the text is, is pointing us back to is the tent of the presence of God, where Moses would put up a shelter, would put up a tent in which he would go and meet with God. Peter sees what's happening. He says, hey, Moses, Elijah, Jesus, all of these guys, they must be meeting with God. Let's do what we do. Let's make sense of it. Let's put them all into tents. Like, let's contain it. Let's try to understand it. And at the end of the day, I think what Peter ends up wanting to do is take what God is doing in front of them, which is new and different, hasn't happened, hasn't been done before, and try to put it in a mental box that he understands. Peter is trying to contain God. He wants to build a shelter. He, he wants to commemorate and contain this amazing gift of, of God's presence and glory. And you think, maybe, hey, maybe Jesus doesn't actually have to die. Like, maybe Jesus was wrong. Because clearly, like, God is present here. Like, maybe this is it. Maybe this is the moment. A and if we, if we do what we know we need to do, and if we build tents, and if we commemorate it, like, let's build a church here, right? Like, th this is something everybody can get behind. This, this, like, maybe this is all that needs to happen. Maybe if we could just hold on to this moment, then, then the next moments don't have to come. I wonder how often we do the same thing. I wonder how often we try to contain what God is doing or try to limit what God is doing according to our own understanding or, or lack of understanding, but according to what we know and can see Right, Peter, like, I'm convinced. Peter knows something is happening. He knows something significant is unfolding in front of him, but he is trying to make it fit into what he would like, into his plans. 
He doesn't get yet how significant this moment really is. Peter doesn't want Jesus to go to Jerusalem. He doesn't want Jesus to have to die on a cross. Peter wants to preserve the mountaintop experience and stay there. One theologian writes it like this, like Peter, we desire to secure in place, if not tie down and domesticate the wild spirit of God's kingdom. We do not wish to face anew the challenge of God's presence. We would like to make the success of the past our own without having to have the courage of those who followed Jesus into the unknown. Yet the church dies or is unfaithful when the achievements of the past are used to ignore the Father's command to listen to Jesus. I wonder what kind of box you may have put God in. I wonder what type of moment you are trying to hold on to or contain. What moment you can't and won't move past. Let me give you an example of a, of a box that I sometimes struggle with, putting God in or, or allowing God to be bigger than, and, and it's a box that I haven't come up with a good name. I just call it the pastor box. The pastor box is like, I don't know, I don't, I don't know how big it is, but it's like the box that convinces me that um, I, I spend a lot of time reading the Bible and I spend a lot of time thinking and I spend a lot of time even praying in, in, as a part of my work, right? The job that I do in preparation for sermons and messages and meeting with people. And, and it's really easy for me to just think, hey, good, my job is done. <laughs> check, like, check that box off, right? So I, I prayed today. Yep, check. I read the Bible today, yep, okay, check. I did some study today, check. And it's all for the purpose of preaching and teaching. And listen, like they overlap, I know they do. But it becomes easy for me to go, hey, it's been a minute since I've actually sat in the silence and the quiet and read scripture, prayed, because God needs to meet with me for me and only for me. <laughs> Because there's something that God needs to work out in my life, right? Like this is, a, this is a box and it's a limitation. Luckily for Peter and luckily for me and maybe luckily for you, God interrupts him. And I find this fascinating that it actually says in verse five, and we're almost done, I promise. It says, while he was still speaking. So Peter hasn't, hasn't stopped talking yet. His mouth is still open. Like he's, he's still trying to get his point across. Like he said, Jesus, I've got this great idea. Before he can even get the whole great idea out, Jesus doesn't even, even need to interrupt him because while he was supposed to be, a bright cloud covered them and a voice from the cloud said, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. Listen to him. It's the voice of God coming down and silencing Peter. But in the middle of his point, he says, listen, stop talking. It's actually, you missed the point. Listen to Jesus. This is an echo of the baptism of, of Jesus. This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Only during the baptism moment, and I don't know if you remember when we were there reading at the beginning of Matthew, we're not quite sure who hears this voice from heaven. Jesus is baptized and a dove descends, light comes down. There's a voice from heaven that says the same thing. This is my son, whom I love. And if there's some ambiguity as to who actually that message is for, whether that is something that is spoken only to Jesus or whether that is something that the by, you know, bystanders, the lookers on, right, would have also heard. Here, there's no ambiguity who the message is for. Here, it's very clear. Uh, this is the voice of God speaking not to Jesus, speaking to the disciples. And it's a voice that continues to echo throughout history and speaks to you. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Listen to him. Verse six, when the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground. They're terrified. And it's like in that moment, they get it. Something happens. They're like, oh, this is different. <laughs> Something is different about this moment. And then in seven, Jesus came and touched them. He says, hey, get up. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. Again, Hauerwas in uh, his commentary on Matthew says this, if we do not fear God, our lives will be, f uh, sorry, excuse me, our lives will be possessed by fears produced by our possessions. 
I love that line. If we do not fear God, our lives will be possessed by fears produced by our possessions. What he's saying is that, listen, your life, my life, is going to be filled with fear until I learn to fear God. Jesus has just said, don't be afraid. Sounds kind of strange, right? Don't be afraid. Uh, Fear God. Don't be afraid. It matters. I think it matters that it's Jesus who invites his disciples, who tells his disciples, don't be afraid. Fearing God is, is not the same as terror. It's not the same as anxiety. It's not this driving worry and dread like, does God love me? I'm not sure. Right? People go to their grave wondering that. That's not what, that's not what we're talking about. Psalm 86 describes it like this. The psalmist writes in this prayer, Teach me your way, Lord, that I might rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I might fear your name. An undivided heart. What does it mean to fear God? It means having an undivided heart. The disciples in in verse 8, they look up and they see no one except Jesus. And practically, right, on one level, Moses and Elijah are just gone. That moment has passed. But metaphorically, spiritually, I think the line speaks to the disciples' clarity of vision. They saw Jesus and only Jesus. They get up with an undivided heart. They know who Jesus is. They know what he is called to do. And they've got God in his right place. They know how to respond. Allow God to be God. I'm not in my life. I'd like to be. Some days, there are days. Would love it. But I'm not. I don't know all of the decisions that you might be facing right now. I don't know the uncertainty that you might be living with. What God might be calling you to next. Right? What box you've put God in. And some of you, I think, may have put a box or put God in a box that, that limits the areas of life that you allow Him to speak into. Right? Yeah, you, can, you can have control of these areas, but definitely not this one. Like that one I'm keeping for myself. Right? Okay? Right? Some of you maybe have put a, a box, a God in a box that just say, listen, like God is not, will never speak to me. I'd love it if he did, but this is never happening, and I've moved on from that, right? Maybe you've just stopped believing, period. There is great hope to be found in allowing God to be God, and in learning to fear God. Proverbs 9 says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I wonder what might you need to do today to get up with an undivided heart.